This is the video lecture, the second video lecture for biotechnology uh, for the lecture that was to be held Friday, January 26th. Uh, so where we left off, we're talking about different laboratory techniques using uh, recombinant DNA. And we're going to talk briefly about gel electrophoresis. And I know this is review for all of you. Uh, you've run gels before in Trent's lab. And, um, this is how you just uh, separate out and visualize DNA. Uh, you take fragments and you um, cut up the fragments using restriction enzymes, and then you visualize the DNA fragments based on size. And agarose is a type of uh, gel that is isolated from seaweed. Um, it's a lot like agar, and when it's melted, in a buffer solution and poured into a tray, um, it will form a semi-solid gel and it has holes in it, has small pores in it, and the pores allow the DNA to travel through it. Um, and depending on how much agarose is put into the gel, that determines the ability for the gel to separate DNA fragments. Um, you can put a high percentage of agarose in that's more difficult for DNA to traverse through, or you can put a low percentage of agarose that makes uh, the gel more permeable to DNA. Okay, and gels range from anywhere from 0.5 to 2% agarose. Anything less than 0.5% agarose uh, wouldn't help hold the gel. Uh, you wouldn't you wouldn't have a contiguous gel; it would just fall apart. Anything above 2%, then there would be no pores for the DNA to uh, be able to traverse through. And when you have a higher percentage gel that is good for smaller size fragments, the smaller size fragments will traverse easily through the um, high gel concentration, whereas larger fragments cannot. Okay, and then you use a low percentage, around 5.5% to resolve large size fragments. So when you do electrophoresis, uh, you take the gel and you submerge it in a buffer solution um, that has electrolyte in it to conduct electricity. Uh, the DNA is loaded into small wells uh, at the top of the gel, and then electrical current is applied through electrodes at opposite ends of the gel. The DNA migrates according to its charge and size and the rate of migration through the gel depends on the size of the DNA. Um, and the sugar phosphate backbone it makes it always negatively subcharged, so the DNA will migrate towards the positive pole. And smaller fragments of DNA are more easily migrate through the gel, so they're uh, more highly attracted to the pole. Um, and then larger fragments will not travel as far. They are all fragments are repelled by the negative pole um, and are trying to escape the negative charge uh, because like uh, in electricity um, repels like. And so you get a um, migration based on size. OK. And so migration distance is roughly inversely proportional to size of the DNA fragment. Larger fragments migrate slowly, smaller fragments migrate faster. And then you add a tracking dye, and that allows um, your, the ability to monitor DNA migration during electrophoresis. OK, and DNA is stained with DNA staining dyes. You use something like ethidium bromide, and ethidium bromide will actually, it doesn't covalently bond, but it intercalcates between DNA base pairs, and then it will fluoresce under UV light. Uh, you can also use uh, radio label dyes um, and then take x ray film, but ethidium bromide is easier to use. And then uh, once the ultraviolet light is produced, to document the gel results. So you'll get actually a photograph of the gel and you don't have to handle the gel itself, okay? And so if you look at the example here, you've got a digest and you've got a ladder. The ladder is just the sizes that are specified, 500, 1,000, 
1,500, 2,000, and you can see that on this 1% gel, um, band B drifted between uh, 1,000 and 1,500, so you would know the approximate size because it's pretty much in between in the middle of band of, of uh, 1,500 and 1,000, so band B would be 1,250. So you take um, different mixtures uh, that have different sizes of DNA. Uh, this could be forensics, so this could be mixtures from crime scenes or from suspects or uh, from victims. And you um, take the mixtures and inject them into the wells using a pipette. Um, you have a negative charge and a positive charge. Uh, the negative charge is near the wells, the positive charge is near the bottom of the gel. Then you apply the electric field and you'll see that the bands will start to migrate. And then uh, on the completed gel, you stain the gel with uh, ophidium bromide. And then you visualize the bands under fluorescent light. Longer fragments are at the top of the gel. Shorter fragments have migrated further and are at the bottom of the gel. And then you see um, an example here with uh, size marker DNA. And you'll see that the scale here is not linear. It's more of a log scale. Okay. Uh, smaller fragments migrate further. And here's uncut lambda DNA. Here's lambda DNA cut with HIND3. Here's E. coli DNA. And here's E. coli DNA cut with HIN3. And you have to see here that E. coli DNA, you've got a very, very large genome. So instead of seeing uh, different distinct bands, you actually see just a contiguous pattern here. And this consists of many, many bands because there's many, many HIN3 sites in the E. coli genome, whereas there's only a few HIN3 sites in the lambda DNA genome. Obviously, the lambda DNA genome is much smaller than the E. coli genome, so you get distinct bands, whereas here you just get a big smear. Okay, then we can use restriction enzymes to map gene structure. They can tell us specific structural features of the genome. So we can cut the clone genes with restriction enzymes and pinpoint the location of the cutting sites based on the band sizes. Okay. And knowing restriction mapping is a useful tool for making clones of small pieces of DNA. Um, and this is called subcloning. And then the small pieces of DNA can be sequenced. Okay. So to do restriction mapping, first we take a uh, plasmid or a small portion of DNA and we digest the DNA with a single or double restriction enzymes all in the same reaction assay. We separate the DNA fragments by a gel electrophoresis, and then we arrange the fragments in order to map the restriction sites. Okay. Uh, we can also do DNA sequencing, and the fundamental type of sequencing called Sanger sequencing uh, relies on uh, some type of gel electrophoresis. Okay. And this is important so we can determine the actual sequence of nucleotides in a clone gene. And chain termination sequencing is the Sanger method. You've probably talked about the Sanger method before. Um, you need a single stranded primer. Um, and during the reaction, this is annealed to um, a DNA uh, denatured template. And the reaction tube uh, with DNA polymerase contains all four uh, nucleotides, uh, deoxynucleotides. So you have um, deoxyadenine, uh, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. Then you have DNA polymerase that uh, does the elongation reaction. And then you have dideoxynucleotides. And dideoxynucleotides are important because once a dideoxynucleotide inserts, it cannot further elongate. It truncates the DNA segment at that particular point because it cannot form a phosphodiester bond with the incoming nucleotide.
Okay. So let's say that we had um, uncut DNA here. Okay, this is back to restriction mapping. I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself. My slides are out of order. But for restriction mapping, here's uncut DNA. Okay, and so it just migrates a little bit. And then we cut the DNA with the BAM H1 site. Okay, and we get two fragments. Okay, so if there's two fragments, that means that there was one BAM H1 site. Okay, the original fragment size was 7 KB. And my fragment sizes are 4.5 and 2.5 KB. And then if I cut with PST1, then I get a 5.5 fragment and a 1.5 fragment. If I cut with both, I get three fragments because there's two unique sites. I get a cut at three, 2.5, and 1.5. And so putting these together, then I know from the end to 2.5, I have a BAMH1 site. Okay. That's a 2.5 fragment here. And then from uh, the other end to, uh, from the BAMH1 to the other end is going to be 4.5. Okay. And then I know I have a PST1 site at 5.5. Uh, because that is 3 KB away from the BAMH1 site, okay? And then from the end, the PST1 site is 7, 7, uh, at 7 KB. Um, I have a 1.5 KB fragment, okay? Now, scientists can now use bioinformatics software to identify restriction sites in the DNA. Um, but with restriction uh, mapping like this, then we can come up with a rudimentary map so we know exactly where the restriction sites are and we know the different restriction fragments that are going to result from a digestion. Okay, back to Sanger sequencing. I do apologize because I think those slides were out of order. Um, so we have four separate reaction tubes. Um, each contain the actual vector the primer, the regular nucleotides, and then a small amount of dideoxynucleotides and DNA polymerase. Okay, and so you get uh, links of DNA of varying size, and over time the dideoxynucleotides will be incorporated into every position available in the newly synthesized strand. So you'll have links that may be one nucleotide, two nucleotides, three nucleotides, as the dideoxynucleotide will migrate into site one, site two, site three, and so on. Okay, then you take a very high concentration uh, polyacrylamide gel, and then you run the fragments out, and you use autoradiography here. Uh, so these are radio-labeled probes. And then you read the gel from the bottom to the top as individual nucleotides. Okay, and the sequence generated from the reaction is complementary to the sequence on the template strand of the vector. Okay, so we have our gel here. And we've run uh, probes for A, probes for C, probes for G, and probes for T. So we can radio label each one of these uh, reaction mixtures with A, G, C, G, and T. Okay. We denature the template, add the primer. Okay. DNA polymerase, we add. Then regular nucleotides and dideoxynucleotides. And then after the primer here, uh, from the DNA template, the first uh, dideoxynucleotide is C, and then G and then A, and then A, and then G, and then T, and C, and so forth. So we can read that up from the bottom of the gel. We see a C first, and then a G, and then we come over to an A, and then we go to a T, and so forth. So you can see that from the bottom to the top of the gel, each one of these bands corresponds to the next dideoxynucleotide that was integrated into the sequence, okay? Um, 
Now this is done by capillary electrophoresis and using the capillary in different dye intensities, then you know whether you've got an A, G, T, or C. And that's just run through a detector and it goes directly to a computer that gives you a chromatograph and the proper sequence. Um, now instead of, um, now the Sanger method can be done high throughput. Used to be that uh, you would only be able to sequence 200 to 400 nucleotides per reaction. Now with the capillary electrophoresis method, you can do greater than 500 nucleotides per reaction. Okay, and Sanger sequencing was the backbone of the Human Genome Project. Okay, and um, instead of in the high throughput method, instead of having four separate reaction tubes, you only have one reaction tube. And just going through this particular procedure, this is the procedure for uh, capillary electrophoresis. Um, each dideoxynucleotide is labeled with a different fluorescent dye. Uh, samples are separated on a capillary gel and then scanned with a laser beam. So each dideoxynucleotide is, gives a unique pattern. Okay, and then that is read by a computer um, through a detector. And then that can do multi multiple capillary gel runs. Uh, each one is about the 900 base pair sequence. And then the computer converts the light patterns and reveals the sequence. Okay. Um, Pyro sequencing, uh, which is also called 454 pyro sequencing, uh, named based on uh, the Roche commercial system, which is also named 454. Um, what you do is you take uh, single stranded genomic DNA and you take the and attach them to the single strand genomic uh, DNA to microbeads, and then you run PCR. Okay, uh, each bead is then loaded to multi-well plates, mixed with DNA uh, polymerase and with regular nucleotides. Okay, and then a single nucleotide flows over each of the wells, and if it's incorporated into the complementary sequence, then a pyrophosphate is released. Pyrophosphates are chemiluminescent, so you can see a specific signal for that particular well if an A is, is incorporated, G, T, or C. And with these unique uh, patterns, then you know that what the, you know, just on a time-based um, uh, scale, you know which nucleotide is being added to which well at a given period of time. Okay. The emitted light from the reaction is captured and recorded by a computer and that will tell you which single nucleotide was incorporated at which time. Okay, and this is very efficient um, with, by repeating the nucleotide flow step, then you can sequence 400 million bases of data in a 10 hour run. Okay, so you can do a lot more than just a single stranded uh, Sanger sequencing method with 900 base pairs, you can do 400 million bases. Okay, and then there are other approaches called next generation sequencing. Okay, there's the ABI solid method and it can produce six gigabases of sequence data per run. Okay, so that's uh, six billion bases and that's similar to the 454 approach, um, but the sequencing technology is slightly different. And then third generation, this uh, involves just pushing single-stranded nucleotide fragments into nanopores and then cleaving off the individual A's, G's, T's, and C's. And then as they're cleaved off, then that will produce a signal that can be captured. And this doesn't involve PCR at all, so you don't have to run PCR in the reaction. You, you need to know nothing about the original sequence uh, because you don't need to uh, use primers. And so you can take just a nascent sequence uh, with no prior knowledge and do sequencing reactions on it. Okay. And here is uh, pyro sequencing, 454 pyro sequencing. So you just take uh, beads with DNA fragments attached, you force them into wells. Okay. And then you 
uh, put the pyrosequencing reaction on, and then you have a primer, then it works its way back to the bead. Okay, here are each one of the primers in blue, okay, that attach directly to the single-stranded DNA. And then DNA polymerase will elongate. And with each reaction, pyrophosphate is produced. Pyrophosphate then makes ATP. ATP um, with luciferin makes oxyluciferin, and that produces a light beam. Okay, and so for each nucleotide being added beyond the priming sequence, then you'll get a specific signal. Okay, nucleotides are flowed directly over the reaction wells, and the nucleotides that incorporate, then for each one of these reaction wells, you'll get a unique signal. Okay, and then that unique signal is picked up using a computer. Okay, another type of method. Uh, this is not a sequencing method, but a gene probing method is called fluorescence in situ hybridization or FISH. Okay, so when you have a chromosome that has a gene of interest uh, and you want to identify which chromosome to probe, then you can use FISH. Um, so you take the cells uh, with the genomic DNA and uh, with distinct chromosomes, so you want to capture the cells during uh, active mitosis. Uh, you mount these on a glass slide. And then you can add a DNA or an RNA probe for the gene of interest. Uh, the DNA or RNA probe is labeled with uh, fluorescent nucleotides and incubated with the slides. And then wherever the probe hybridizes uh, with a complementary sequence, uh, then that will cause the chromosome to light up on the slide. The slide is washed to get rid of excess probe and then exposed to fluorescent light. Okay, and that way, wherever the probe is bound to the chromosome, it will illuminate, so that will indicate uh, not only the chromosome that's involved with that particular gene, but uh, the location on the chromosome as well. Okay, so when we do fish, um, you can use a karyotype to directly show which chromosome shows fluorescent. You label the, take the probe DNA, label it, hybridize it, uh, or denature, and then that will hybridize with denatured chromosomal DNA. Okay. And then down here, uh, down here we have then you can see small bits of light coming off of this karyotype here. And wherever there's a small bit of light, that means the presence of the nucleus ac nucleic acid probe and the presence of the gene that you're interested in. And some fluorescence may uh, be on more than one chromosome, and it may be a gene located on more than one chromosome or the se nucleotide sequence that you're probing for. So uh, typically, you only have genes on one chromosome in the human genome, but you may have consensus sequences that are located on multiple chromosomes. Another way to determine gene copy number is called uh, southern blotting. Um, southern blotting is also used for gene mapping, uh, detection of gene mutations, uh, con confirmation of product, a uh, PCR product, once you've got a PCR product, and then also DNA fingerprinting. So you digest chromosomal DNA into small fragments, separate this on a gel. Uh, you treat the gel with an alkaline solution. The alkaline solution denatures the DNA and exposes the template. And then you plot fragments directly off of the gel onto a nylon or nitrocellulose filter. And then the blot is baked or exposed to UV light to permanently attach the DNA to the blot. And then it's incubated with some type of probe and exposed to uh, photographic film by autoradiography. And then the number of bands on the film represents the gene copy number. The probe is specific for the gene, so if you see the probe in multiple locations, 
that means there's multiple copies of a gene. Okay, so let's say we have a gene of interest and we digest with BAMH1 and we digest with ECOR1. Okay. And then we have a probe that's complementary to the gene of interest. We cut up our DNA with restriction enzymes. Okay. And then we run it out on um, agarose gel. We take the agarose gel and then we blot it uh, with a membrane. This shows just paper towels and a weight. Uh, there are actually uh, chambers where you can blot this that are much more efficient than this. Okay. Then you peel off the blot. You take the blot, you put it into a little plastic baggie and you take the DNA probes, and the DNA probes then will light up wherever the gene is located. So we know that uh, when we digest with BAMH1, um, we get one gene of interest, and when we digest with ECOR1, we actually cut the gene in half. So ECOR1 is, shows two smaller bands, okay, each that hybridized partially with the probe, and that tells us that BAMH1 is giving us one fragment, ECOR1 is giving us two fragments. A way to complete analysis of RNA uh, to study gene expression is through a northern blot. Okay, and at this, uh, in this method, we can look at messenger RNA that is being produced, transcribed from different genes uh, produced in a tissue. And in the northern blot analysis, our basic method is similar to southern blotting, only instead of working with genomic DNA or restriction digested DNA, uh, we're dealing with messenger RNA. Okay. The RNA is isolated from tissue of interest. We separate it by gel electrophoresis, blot it onto a membrane, and then we hybridize it to label DNA probe. Uh, we can use a DNA probe because DNA will hybridize messenger RNA. Then we expose the bands on an autoradiograph to show the presence of the messenger RNA for the gene of interest, and that will also show the size of the mRNA transcript. Then we can compare and quantify amounts of messenger RNA present at different tissues for a given gene. Okay, and here's messenger RNA, and you can see different blot, um, and you can see that in different regions, uh, you get different protein expression, one, two, three, and four are different tissues and you're looking at the same mRNA transcript, and obviously three and four have a lot more than one and two. Uh, blot two is exclusive to three and four, and blot three looks like it's a constitutively expressed gene because there's lots of it at, uh, in any of the different tissues that are being analyzed. Down here is another blot. Uh, this is a northern blot where actin and defensin genes are being probed. And you can see conditions where nothing is expressed, actin only, defensin only, and then both at the same time. Instead of doing a northern blot, you can also do reverse transcription PCR or RT-PCR. Um, and this is where you have a very low level of detection. Uh, with the northern blot, you need lots of messenger RNA in order to probe and detect. But if you have a low level of expression, then you can amplify up that signal using RT-PCR. So you isolate the mRNA of interest, and then you use a reverse transcriptase enzyme to make double-stranded cDNA. You actually have to use reverse transcriptase to make single-stranded, and then uh, DNA polymerase to make it double-stranded. Then using PCR, you amplify the region of cDNA that you're interested in with a set of primers that are specific to that gene. Uh, you run the PCR fragments on an agarose gel and you separate, separate them out. 
uh, then you determine the expression pattern in tissues and the amount of cDNA that's produced in RT-PCR is directly proportional to the amount of RNA and level of gene expression. Um, you can also use uh, quantitative PCR or real-time PCR and that will give you a direct uh, comparison of expression between two expressed genes. Okay, so you can quantify ampl ampl amplification reactions as they occur in real time. And you need a special thermocycler because in the thermocycler you're actually measuring the reaction. It's not just occurring, so you need a laser to scan a beam of light through the top or the bottom of each PCR reaction and look at look for specific probes in that reaction. Um, each reaction tube then contains either a dye uh, containing probe or a DNA binding dye that emits fluorescent light when illuminated by the laser. The light emitted by the dye correlates with the amount of pre-CR product amplified. And then that light is captured by a detector at the other side of the tube, which relays the information directly to a computer to provide the amount of fluorescent. And then you can plot that and you can quantitate the number of PCR products produced after each cycle. Okay. And so here we have a hybridization reaction. Okay. Got a primer, uh, five to three, five to three here. And then you hybridize the primers and you extend and you've got a radio label probe. Okay, that's attached to the nucleotide. And when that nucleotide is incorporated into the sequence, then that radio label dye then will start to emit. Okay, and then it will excite when um, uh, excite, uh, it will emit when it's excited by a laser. Uh, when it incorporates that particular uh, nucleic acid probe. And then over thermocycling, then you can quantify roughly low expression and high expression of different genes. Okay. Uh, another way to study gene expression is just to look at gene microarrays. And then uh, with a microarray, you can study upwards to 10,000 genes at a time. So you can study all of the genes expressed in a given tissue in a very quick fashion. Uh, these uh, use a small glass microscope slide. Single-stranded DNA molecules that are specific to the genes are spotted on the slide using a robotic arm called an arrayer, and that fixes the DNA, uh, which is just multiple copies of cDNA at different spots on the slide. And every coordinate of every specific gene is recorded by the computer. So during hybridization, when that spot lights up, the computer knows exactly which spot correlates to which gene. So to do an array, uh, this is after the array has been constructed. You just take the mRNA of a tissue, and then you treat that mRNA with reverse transcriptase. Uh, so you make cDNA, and then the cDNA is labeled with a fluorescent dye. The label the cDNA is incubated overnight on the glass slide on the array where it hybridizes with different spots on that array, and it will hybridize wherever it sees a complementary DNA sequence. Uh, like I said, you can have over 10,000 spots of DNA. Then you wash the array after incubation, and you scan it by a laser and that laser then excites the dye and it causes it to fluoresce. Uh, the fluorescent spots reveal which genes were upregulated and the intensity of the fluorescence indicates the relative amount of gene expression. So we take our tissue sample here, isolate the messenger RNA, convert the messenger RNA to cDNA, uh, using fluorescently labeled nucleotides um, that integrate as the cDNA. Then we have single-stranded cDNA here. Okay. Then we take our cDNA sample and we hybridize it directly to our glass slide, our microarray. Okay. 
uh, we rinse off the excess cDNA after incubation. We put the microarray in a scanner that measures fluorescence. And then we get some type of readout down here where the genes express. So bright, bright fluorescent means high gene expression. Moderate fluorescence means low gene expression. And then no fluorescence means no expression. And this portion over here regarding the hybridization is just the way that the genes hybridize directly to the glass slide. Um, it's common to do a microarray where you can look at two different conditions. So you add two different colored dyes, uh, one for the experimental condition and the other for the control condition. The laser is then scanned at different wavelengths for each probe, and then the images can be overlaid to make a direct comparison between the treatment and control. So you know what's upregulated in the treatment and what's downregulated in the treatment. So you could look at gene expression for cancer cells versus normal cells and find genes possibly involved in cancer progression. Okay. Uh, then we can do gene mutagenesis studies. Um, this is to study the structure and function of a protein produced by a specific gene. And there's two ways that you can do this. You can do site-directed mutagenesis, where you very specifically change single nucleotides in the clone gene. And the gene is then expressed in cells, which result in a mutated protein. And then that procedure lets uh, researchers study the effect on mutated proteins, uh, as well as uh, giving specific information on which nucleotides are important to the function of the protein. That's very useful to identify critical sequences uh, in a protein produced that may involve a disease. Okay. Um, another method that is used is RNA interference. And this is just an RNAi happens naturally in the cell, and it will inhibit gene expression um, at the translational level. So you just take double-stranded RNA, you bind it to a dicer enzyme, and it cuts it into small interfering RNA. Small interfering RNA is then bound to a protein RNA complex called the RNA-induced silencing complex, or RISC complex. Uh, RISC unwinds the double-stranded DNA RNA, and it releases single-stranded RNA that binds complementary messenger RNA in the cell. And then that leads to the degradation of the messenger RNA by what's called a slicer enzyme, or it blocks translation by interfering with the upstream ribosome binding. Okay, and um, different techniques, RNAi is even being considered as a medical procedure to silence genes that may in be involved in things like inflammation. And it can also be in the laboratory to silence gene expression and uh, to look at the fate of particular organisms when a uh, particular gene is silenced. Okay, and here's your double-stranded RNA. The dicer um, enzyme splits this into um, siRNA. siRNA, including the slicer, then, um, uh, or, I'm sorry, siRNA then binds to the wrist protein complex. Okay, one strand is degraded by the slicer, and then you have siRNA single stranded with the wrist complex. This binds messenger RNA and uh, it inhibits translation by degrading the messenger RNA or inhibiting the ribosome from binding. Uh, the risk complex can also bind DNA and inhibit transcription. Um, so because RNA will bind DNA, and so that will um, limit RNA polymerase's ability to transcribe the gene as well. Okay. So let's talk about genomics and bioinformatics. Uh, these are very hot disciplines in biotechnology right now. Okay, genomics. 
when we are looking at entire genomes, uh, we're cloning, sequencing, or doing some type of analysis, that's genomics. Okay, and you can actually um, shotgun sequence or shotgun clone uh, just by taking the entire genome and digesting pieces of the genome um, using restriction enzymes. This produces thousands of overlapping fragments. These fragments are called contigs, and you sequence each contig. And then once the contigs are sequenced, then um, you put them into a computer program. The computer program um, matches uh, overlapping sequences um, and it uses the program to align the sequence fragments into a uh, continuous chromosome. So if I have genomic DNA here and I've got four fragments, I digest them with ECOR1 and BAMH1, okay? Then when I digest with ECOR1, then I know that I get fragments one and fragment two, three, four. When I digest with BAMH1, I get fragment one, two, and then individual fragments three and four. I collect those and I sequence them. And then I put them into a computer database to see if sequences have been identified. And then I can overlap them in another computer program where I know that fragment one from ECOR1 overlaps with fragment one, two from BAMH1. Fragment two, three, four overlaps uh, with fragment two and then three and four overlap with three and four. And then that, that will give me the assembly that I started out with, one, two, three, four, only I'll have sequence information. Um, I can also blast these once I know the sequence, and then I can identify and look for aligning sequences that are already known in the BLAST database. Okay, now in addition to genomics, there's bioinformatics. And bioinformatics is merely merging molecular biology with computer techniques. And so it involves computer science and information technology to uh, promote uh, the understanding of biological processes. And in bioinformatics, you have large databases. These store, share, and obtain the maximum amount of information related to gene structure, gene sequence and expression, and protein structure and function. Okay, and then the uh, GenBank database is a public collection of DNA sequences. You may have used GenBank before, and it contains all of the National Institutes of Health collection of DNA sequences. Okay, each entry has an accession number, and uh, scientists use those to refer back to a clone sequence. So if you have a sequence of DNA that is on GenBank, then you will have an accession number that corresponds with that sequence. This is maintained by the NCBI, or the National Center for Biotechnology Information. And this is just um, a search tool that I've used before with Iron Mountain Mine called BLAST. It's basic local alignment search tool. And what it does is it searches GenBank. So let's say we have the human obesity gene and we're trying to align that with the mouse obesity gene. Whenever there is sequence overlap, then you get a vertical line uh, where the uh, nucleotides match. Wherever there's a gap, then you get dashes where the gap would occur, okay? And wherever there isn't sequence alignment, where you have a different sequence or a different uh, nucleic acid, then there's no vertical line. So you can see uh, a significant amount of homology between the human obesity gene and the mouse obesity gene, uh, but there are some gaps. Okay. And looking at the Human Genome Project, this is sort of the ultimate expression of bioinformatics. Uh, this was started in 1990 by the U.S. Department of Energy, and um, it was in the international collaboration to identify all the human genes and sequence all the base pairs of 24 human chromosomes. And they didn't just do one person because there's variability in the human chromosome. So they actually looked at about 40 unique individuals. Um, 
This was done in 20 centers in 18, 18 countries. And uh, J. Craig Venter uh, was the collaborator. He started as a competitor, but because he was doing so well with the project, he became a collaborator. And he worked for a company called Solera Genomics. Okay. And the Human Genome Project uh, was able to analyze genetic variability among humans. And so uh, the project was able to identify thousands of single nucleotide polymorphisms. These are just single nucleotide mutations in specific uh, gene coding regions that would uh, perhaps cause the protein to be different. Uh, some would be silent and then some would be in the promoter and terminator regions. Uh, they also mapped and sequenced the genomes of model organisms. Uh, this is more of a practice to uh, not only to gain information, but to be able to develop the sequencing techniques needed for humans. And uh, they developed new high powered sequencers and computational technologies. And then the human genome was uh, essentially put on GenBank. Uh, it's publicly available information and that was used to advance our analysis and understanding of gene structure and function. Okay, the information was disseminated. And then once the information was disseminated, uh, then all of a sudden uh, genetic identity issues became a problem and uh, genetic privacy. And so uh, the ethical, legal, and social issues that accompanied the Human Genome Project and genetic research were discussed. And at the end, on April 14th, 2003, the full map of the genome was released. Uh, it turns out that only up to 25,000 genes can code protein. These code about 100,000 different proteins because individual genes can code more than one protein. And the map was completed with all of the 3,000, or excuse me, 3 billion bases identified and placed in order. And then we see the different genes uh, from one, two, three, four, all the way to 22 X and Y. You see the total number of bases in each gene um, and the total number of genes. Okay, total number of genes is in dark blue, total number of bases is in light blue. The different things that we've learned is that nearly 50% of the genes uh, have an unknown function. It doesn't mean that they don't have a function. This uh, bullet is incorrect, but we just don't know the function as scientists yet. Uh, the human genome it consists of about 3.1 billion base pairs. Uh, identity is 99.9% um, between different nationalities. And there's a lot of single nucleotide polymorphisms in copy, num copy number variations. Um, CNVs are long deletions, insertions, duplications in the genome. Um, and that accounts for most of the genomic diversity in between humans. And less than 2% of the genome actually codes for genes. The energetic regions uh, have different functions. Uh, we're now unlocking those functions. And uh, some are more considered more, more primordial and insertions uh, from adenovirus, other types of viruses where genes have inserted uh, from infected viruses and they're now in the human genome. So the vast majority of our DNA is non-protein coding and repetitive sequences where you see uh, just uh, um, tandem repeat, short tandem repeat, um, and variable number repeats uh, account for about 50% of the non-coding DNA. Okay, and here is a slice of the different genes, uh, what they're used for. Um, many genes are capable of making more than one protein. So human cells can make at least 100,000 proteins from only 20,000 genes. Chromosome 1 contains the highest number of genes, and the Y chromosome contains the fewest. 
and we have a sequence homology. We have sequence similarity to genes in other organisms. And uh, thousands of disease genes have been identified and mapped uh, in their chromosomal locations. And the difference between the disease gene and the normal gene are now known. Okay. And with human genomics, uh, we also got the omics revolution. Uh, when I was in the National Laboratory, I studied proteomics for a very long time. Metabolomics, when you look at all the proteins and enzymatic pathways involved in cellular metabolism. Glycomics for studying carbohydrates. Transcriptomics for studying gene expression. Uh, metagenomics, where you look at genomes of entire communities. Uh, when we did the metagenomics for Iron Mountain Mine, we actually identified about 300,000 different genes in, uh, involved in uh, a whole uh, community of organisms that live in acid mine drainage. And then pharmacogenomics, which is um, customized medicine based on the person's genetic profile for a particular condition. And then nutrigenomics, which is the interaction between genes and diet. Uh, in comparative genomics, then you map and sequence genomes from a number of model organisms. And then you look at differences in structure and function of these organisms so you can understand uh, how other species uh, may function, uh, including humans. Okay. Uh, there's what's called Stone Age genomics. This is paleogenomics. And um, you can analyze ancient DNA, but you need to bear in mind that the half-life of DNA, uh, this is quoted at 10,000 years. I've seen other quotes of 50,000 years, so this is under debate. Um, there was an article that hypothesized that we could clone Neanderthal babies because the DNA half-life is uh, would not be that uh, the DNA age would not be that old compared to the half-life. Uh, it's never been done. Um, you can check out the article if you'd like. And that concludes the video lecture for chapter three. Okay, so at this point. In chapter three, we've covered the entire chapter uh, from beginning to end, and so that will be on the exam.